Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on moviehousememories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. to another episode of movie house memories the podcast where we look back and review the films that we think are the most important films in cinema history i'm patrick and with me as always are three people who spent a large portion of their lives in darkened movie theaters first the author of duty honor empire a 25th century love story and the coach calhoun to our little group of uh, individuals chris haley you know i got some chills earlier but they weren't multiplying so i think there might be something wrong with me uh, also with us as uh, the woman who's the actual inspiration for Sandy, Lori Flores. Hello. <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> what? Now, are you Sandra D? <laughs> yeah, that's where I was going. Yeah, thanks. Finally, We're going to wait till the very end when you're all whored out. <laughs> <laughs> that's when she's at her best. Finally, <laughs> then. <laughs> what? That's not very nice to call her that, just because she likes pants a little tight. Yeah, and no underwear, but that's okay. That's all right. So, finally, the man is the youngest member of our group and an actual pussy rider. Matt Palmer. He hates good to that. be here and good to be greasy. <laughs> Laura hates that. I threw that in there. I do. How'd you know? <laughs> Why don't you like the word rider? <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's from your film and you picked it. I You're didn't know that's dirty. what it said. That's not what I sang when I was a kid. Hey, I was going to use the jokes that he makes all the chicks scream, but we didn't. I, I thought that was going too far. It's scream. <laughs> I'm just glad you didn't use an attempted rape joke. <laughs> I kind of want to hear Lori's version of some of these songs. <laughs> <laughs> How she hears it in her head. When we were in high school and we changed the words. The so. chicks will scream? Yes. Oh, mm-hmm. okay. That's She's a, a- dragon wagon she's a real dragon <laughs> okay All right and if you haven't figured it out yet this week we're reviewing 1978's Grease the, the next musical that Laurie nominates for one of the best films of all time go figure yeah Laurie do you have a summary for us I really do does it have musical interludes it does okay <laughs> the post World War II era saw the birth of a new teen identity these Bobby Soxers and Greasers had their own fashion, slang, and music. The movie Grease, which is based upon the Broadway hit musical, humorously celebrates this teenage culture. Greaser Danny Zuko, played by John Travolta, falls in love with wholesome and pure Sandy Olson, portrayed by Olivia Newton-John, at the beach over the summer. They believe they are saying goodbye as Sandy returns to her native Australia when the summer is over. Fast forward to the first day of school at Rydale High School. Sandy is trying to make friends with the pink ladies, a rough group of girls. She tells them about her summer nights. Danny tells a racier version to his greaser friends, who are a gang known as the T-Birds. The pink ladies giggle when they learn that Sandy's Prince Charming is their friend, Danny Zuko. The Danny they know is not so innocent. He has dated most of the girls at the school, including Rizzo, played by Stockard Channing, A jaded Rizzo is anxious to show Sandy the real Danny and arranges for them to reunite at a high school pep rally in front of the T-Birds. Rizzo knew that Danny would play it cool in front of his friends. Sandy is devastated. What happened to the Danny Zuko that she met at the beach? Danny shows a second of remorse and then continues on with the guys. Frenchie, played by Dee Dee Khan, tries to cheer up Sandy and invites her to a slumber party. Frenchie announces that she is dropping out of Rydell to attend beauty school. She offers to pierce the girl's ears, which does not end well for Sandy. Rizzo finds Sandy's innocence annoying and makes fun of her. Marty, played by Dinah Manoff, writes a letter to a Marine pen pal. A hurt Sandy 
ends up in the backyard swearing that she is hopelessly devoted to Danny's face in a kiddie pool. Rizzo and Kaniki, played by Jeff Conway, are now an item in the backseat of Kaniki's car. A member of a rival gang interrupts them and damages the car. The boys work together to fix the car. They dream of what grease lightning will look like and do for them when she is all fixed up. Danny sees that Sandy is dating a jock and decides to try and impress her. He attempts unsuccessfully to join several sports teams before settling on track. Sandy sees him fall during a practice and runs to see if he is okay. They get back together but find it awkward to be around the T-Birds and Pink Ladies. At a malt shop, Danny and Sandy leave early as couples begin to pair up for the big dance, which will be televised. Rizzo and Kaniki get in a huge fight, ending with spilled milkshake on Kaniki and Frenchie. Frenchie removes the scarf from her head to reveal that beauty school is not going well. In fact, she is now a beauty school dropout with Frankie Avalon as her teen angel. To get back at Kaniki, Rizzo invites a rival gang leader, the one that damaged his car, to the big dance. Kaniki responds by taking the gang leader's girlfriend, Cha-Cha de Gregorio. Cha-Cha is an amazing dancer and happens to have also dated Danny. Marty goes to the dance alone and flirts with the American bandstand host, Vince Fontaine. The night seems to be going well for Danny and Sandy until the dance-off. They are one of the last couples remaining when Cha-Cha cuts in and wins the contest with Danny. Sandy storms out of the dance, and Danny is too busy dancing to care. While Danny and Cha-Cha dance the spotlight dance, several of the guys moon the camera. After making up again, Danny gives Sandy his class ring and tries to put some moves on her. Sandy throws the ring at him and leaves him stranded, alone at the drive-in movie. Also at the drive-in, the word spreads that Rizzo thinks she has a bun in the oven. When Kaniki hears of it, he offers to help. Rizzo crushes him by telling him it isn't his. Kaniki and his rival have arranged a race. Kaniki gets a head injury and Danny ends up driving for him and winning. Sandy watches from afar and asks Frenchie for help. It is now already the last day of school and Rydell has a big carnival. Danny shows up in his letterman sweater, ready to impress Sandy. Maybe Frenchie should have stayed in beauty school because she has completely transformed Sandy to the delight of Danny. Danny and Sandy get back together as do Rizzo and Kaniki after Rizzo announces that she is not PG. The whole gang is back together again and they celebrate with another memorable song. Yay! And then they celebrate with another memorable song. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Then they fly off into the sky oh, in the pussy I forgot wagon. to mention the clap. Stop it. <laughs> oh, Increased lightning is what it's called. All right. <laughs> Films are not made in a vacuum. They're influenced by the times that they're made in. And we look back at some of those headlines in Lori Flores' Headlines of the Time. Okay, in 1978, <laughs> the Nobel Peace, Peace Prize. Let me start. She's over. fixated on P words now, and she can't. Get it. <laughs> Look what you guys have done. I'm gonna start over. Okay. Okay. In 1978, the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to Israel's Menachem Begin and Egypt's Anwar Sadat. Can an Israeli <laughs> man be named Bacon? Begin. Begin. Oh. <laughs> Did I say it like bacon? The year saw three popes. As Pope John Paul died on August 6th, his successor, John Paul I, died on September 8th, and he was replaced by John Paul II. Jim Jones' followers drank the Kool-Aid and committed mass suicide in Jonestown, Guyana. Sony introduced the Walkman. They have one on display in the Smithsonian. I had one, and also in the Sony is my Al calculator. Did you guys have one of those? Al calculator? Al, it was like a math game, and also my Welcome Back Cotter lunchbox. Is it in the Smithsonian? It's in the Smithsonian. Your yes. personal one, or did they just find a brand new one? <laughs> Not my personal one, but the lunchbox I had. That's when you know you're old. That's when your stuff's in the Smithsonian. Um, the Grammy-winning record of the year was the Eagles Hotel California. And album of the year was Fleetwood Mac's Rumors. The first test tube baby was born at a London hospital. Balloon angioplasty was pioneered to treat artery blockage. Um, the Cowboys defeated the Broncos in the Super Bowl. How 
about Jim Catwalk? Yes. yes, I did. The average median. <laughs> The average median wage was sixty. Steelers out. couldn't even make it there. How about Jim Cowboys? Yeah! They tried to share the wealth. They didn't want to. You know, that's why the money. next year the Cowboys are like, well, we'll give you one. Okay, just one for you. Yeah, what? Oh, yeah, right. Okay. The average median wage was 15000 The average price of gasoline was $0.67 cents per gallon. And you could still buy unleaded gasoline, which sold for $0.63 cents a gallon. And playing in theaters was The Deer Hunter, Heaven Can Wait, Coming Home, and one of my all-time favorite movies and one of the best musicals ever, Three. And I wasn't as depressing this time, was I? No. <laughs> That's a it, little was a, bit. it was a happier year. Yes, much more optimistic. There wasn't death and destruction and Steeler victories, so it was much happier <laughs> news for everyone. All right, we usually begin our discussions with the uh, casting of the film, and this is no different. We, this, this time we'll start with uh, the obvious male lead of the film, John Travolta, playing high school at 24 years of age. Lori, what did you think of uh, Johnny Travolta in this film? I think he was perfect. I actually, <laughs> um, we saw a... Uh, Broadway traveling production of Greece and he and Jeff Conway were in it. But they he they weren't the stars. They were supporting characters. When did you see this? When I was I don't know, I was really young. The only reason I remember it is because we have the program and there's pictures of them. Really? <laughs> yeah, I don't really have a memory of it. I do remember seeing the movie. I remember my mom taking me to the theater to see it, to see Greece. The movie. The movie, yes. Okay. And but I, I don't really remember seeing the play, although I did. What part did yeah. Travolta play? I think he was just in the chorus. He was just a. He was um, just. One he has of a the... big ensemble cast. So he was just a T bird. Yeah, I mean, I don't even think he was one of the named characters. He and Jeff Conway were just kind of extras. Well, other than Adrian Zmed playing the part, uh, I thought he was perfectly cast for this. Adrian's a med. That's the next film, isn't it? Yes, it is. Matt, what did you think of uh, Travolta? I thought casting a 24-year-old was a um, surprisingly good pick for a movie about kids having sex with each other. <laughs> it took a little bit of the creepy out of it when it was like, oh, well, that's more of a grown man. Yeah, but, I mean, he's arguably the youngest of the entire cast. Yeah. Yeah. I think some of the kids in school had gray hairs in their beard. No, I liked, uh, you know, on some level it was better that they didn't cast, like, actual people in high school because I think that would have made it just a little awkward. Yeah, but it's hard to watch this film – I mean, I guess John Travolta is better than their first pick, who was Henry Winkler. <laughs> seems old for Happy Days and would have seemed really old for Greece at the time. Yeah. Uh, even though this is still early in the run of Happy Days, but... Yeah, he hadn't jumped the shark yet. What about Olivia Newton-John, who was only 30 years old upon the release of this film? So only 12 years out of high school. Matt. Yeah, it's all right, I guess. You know... I... I'll say she she didn't look 30. She might have looked like she was only 23, which for a high school senior, it can't look, still look a little old. But, <laughs> I mean, this isn't a role that really required a lot of acting virtuosity. So, you know, <laughs> she did it. She she needed to be able to sing, which she can do. That's that's definitely yeah. in her wheelhouse. She sang well. I, I'm so biased. <laughs> she was perfect. <laughs> What can I say? I can't. This is like the first movie I ever enjoyed. And this was the soundtrack played every day in my childhood. So I'm just so biased. What films I, did I your parents watch. torture you with? This is the first, <laughs> this is the first film I ever enjoyed. <laughs> that I remember. Oh, okay. I mean, I'm, yeah, that I remember. So I just think she was perfect. She she did a very good job at playing a goody two shoes girl, and I think anybody next to 
any of the girls next to Stalker Channing would have looked <laughs> very young. So I, I don't – she didn't really look terribly old for high school. And I do think she has an amazing voice. And if you think about some of the singers of the 70s, she's got to be one of the top vocalists of the 70s. So uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't have even thought twice to pick her for this film. No, I would agree. With I think I, of the cast, I think she's probably the best cast as far as she did. Although she's 30, I don't think she, I think she looks the youngest of them all. And I think her vocal range is she's obviously the best singer of the of the group or the the cast entirely. So I thought she was the best cast in the film, although I liked Travolta as well. But um, Olivia Newton-John, I think, was uh, her talent suited the role as best as anybody else. But let's let's go to my favorite stalker Channing clocking in at 34 years old when the film is released playing a high school senior now this is some sort of remedial high school right Lori I mean this is not this isn't like the uh, a normal high school there they failed a few grades and this is where they get sent it's a normal high school but it takes longer for some people to graduate it's a normal California <laughs> high school <laughs> all right Lori I tell thought, us about stalker I also thought she was fabulous she brought a lot of depth and emotion to the character of Rizzo. Um, the play is much more kind of campy and they kind of made the movie a little more serious. And, and I, I thought she did a great job. I couldn't imagine much more campy than this film, <laughs> but I actually, I, I like Stockard Channing in a lot of the things she does. And I do like her in this, despite the fact that she does look old enough to be a teenage kid's mom. But um, she probably was a teenage kid's mom at that point. <laughs> she probably could have been, but I do believe that age aside, I do think she understood the type of person that Rizzo was, and she conveyed that very well. Yeah, she was okay. She looked old. <laughs> um, wow, that's a Lori answer. <laughs> I mean, they, this, this just. Just say it, Matt. You hate the whole film. Well, it wasn't the kind of movie that that really acting played a huge part in. I mean, it was it was, you know, she she did fine for the role she was given. I I, I don't have any complaints. Well, one of the things that acting is you make the audience believe that you are that person, that role. So in this case, you have to make the audience believe that you are a high school student, and she looks more like a high school teacher. It just I just that's my my biggest complaint of. Greece is that they obviously look far older than they are the the roles they're supposed to be playing but i do agree with matt that it does it's a film that's very much driven by sex and it would be weird to see actual high school seniors <laughs> playing that role although i think even that day and age you could find a 21 year old or a 22 year old it's Tra a travolta not the youngest looking 24 year old by any stretch of the imagination but i think yeah it, it's it doesn't go beyond the realms of the possibility, but I think like Kaniki and I think, you know, Stalker Channing both look way, way too old. And Dee Dee Khan, although she's actually pretty young, she just seems old looking. Pink Carroll do that to a girl. That's true. That um, gray haired waitress, um, a little known fact, but she was a freshman in college. <laughs> no, she wasn't. That's Joan Blunt <laughs> who starred in Gold Diggers of 1939. Was that the year? That's and scary that you know that. <laughs> <laughs> For me, the hardest part of making the movie was staying true to what I felt Greece was really about, that it was about a pretty tough high school, because I felt that that's what would translate. And I talked to Randall at some length, and I said, I want to keep the high school grittiness of experience in it, and I think we did. Yes, it got a little sugar-coated here and there, but I think we did. That was Greece choreographer Patricia Birch talking about what Greece was really about from the documentary, The Time, The Place, The Motion, Remembering Greece. All right, let's uh, go to symbolism, Chris. Now, you're going to have to dig deep. You know, we should change this to symbol symbolism and innuendo for this particular. Symbolism. Well, that that's kind of what I was going to go with. And uh, since this is a film about sex or sexual themes, I was just going to ask you all, were they all virgins in this film other than um, Rizzo, who I think is pretty much was not. Well, Sandy was, I mean, that's, San kind, that's kind of I the story. All of the girls were virgins, I think, except for Rizzo and Cha-Cha. 
I think Danny was. I think that he just was protecting his um, – he had a reputation that he was his playboy, but I don't think he had ever even been around uh, second base as that scene with him in the car trying to uh, sneeze and get his hand closer on her boob. Um, he, he didn't have any game. And Kanicki, clearly when he was in the in the car, he it was his, his condom broke that he had had – that he bought since he was, what, 12? <laughs> so he'd had that for a while. So clearly that was his first time. Really, I think they were all, all the guys I think were virgins in this film, except for Eugene, who probably was a, had his own little pussy wagon, huh, Lori? I did not see that as the theme of this movie <laughs> at all. What? <laughs> I didn't. I didn't even know to... that was in this movie until... I did it when we were in high when we were in high school. We did the play and we had to change the words. I had no idea. Okay, but in high school, you started to realize that one of the underlying things is a very sexual in nature. Yes, I realized there was the innuendo, but I still don't think that's. I I just think that yeah, I don't appreciate that part of it, and that was why I didn't have my children see it until they were older, even though it was my favorite movie as a child, but. I I just um but it, I know I can't deny that it's there but I try to ignore it. <laughs> Matt, I found it difficult to ignore. <laughs> um, I, I gotta say I, I wasn't thinking much about it. I think I think Chris is right for the most part. This this looked like a bunch of uh, kids who wanted to talk like like they knew what they were talking about, but for the most part, it seemed pretty clueless. So I, I I don't I can't say exactly who or who I did not think would be a virgin, but I think that's as much of a theme of the movie as you know any actual sex would be. So I you know I think that Chris is right. I think almost all of them probably would be virgins uh, in the movie. Yeah, I I disagree with it a little bit. I think uh, Zuko is probably a little bit of a player in this film. I, I can see the the Kaniki analogy that you know he's had the condom since he's 12 you would think that he would have used it before then if he was a little bit more experienced obviously Rizzo's experienced I mean she she doesn't she doesn't hesitate to jump into bed with Kaniki and she's obviously pursuing pursuing Zuko at the beginning of the film and they and that's one of the main reasons I don't think he is I don't give much thought to a lot of the supporting characters although uh, what's, what's her name Maraschino I can't remember her first Mark. name Mar Marty. Yeah, that I you know, she gets the impression of she's a little a uh, little trampish, maybe. I mean, she has a lot of boyfriends, so she was a little bit more because she's hitting on the older guy and kind of I mean throwing the kind of the flaunting out there. Oh yeah, like Maraschino like cherry, you know, so that's that's Well, she's holding on to the camera firmly. Right. Uh Matt, what about your moral universe portion or your moral universe problem? Yeah, I um, didn't find anything terribly um, complex in this movie. I, I thought what this movie falls into the uh, genre that's always being revisited, but of the just uh, high school nostalgia films that we see popping up at, all the time. So yeah. again, for, you know, we're talking about a twenty-year-old movie, so we have something for a, an older generation to to look back at this really kind of silly whitewashed you know high school experience that's a completely you know safe completely uh glorified thing and i don't know how this would have looked to audiences in 1978 but just absurd at every level um and i think you know you kind of get that everything is so safe even when it's dangerous like this car race like these these rival i don't know what to call them gangs and even the uh sexual behavior, all of this stuff just seems like it's perfectly enclosed within a, a harmless universe where nothing really goes too wrong even when it does or or anything like that. So I, I think this is just you know, just, just a, a nostalgic flick about about high school back in the day. So nothing complicated. It's just kids being kids for the most part is the way the movie sees itself and you know, everybody graduates and grows up, uh, supposedly takes off in a flying car. Well, I do see a moral universe problem, and I guess we can discuss this as we talk about the, the ending of the film. And uh, I know Laurie and I kind of 
have touched upon this, like in discussions between ourselves, like kind of what the ending of this film, as far as a message towards women in particular, um, Laura, do you want to address kind of what one of your problems with the film? Sure. I really felt strongly about not letting, I not wanting my daughter to watch it until she was older because I just, I just feel like it, it has a horrible message, but then you pointed out that it, it's not just Sandy that changes that Danny attempted to change. And so when I watched it this time, I was more aware that all of the characters just seem to not be comfortable with themselves. None of them, even, even um, Danny, even, you know, the, the ones that were supposed to be cool. And so it kind of, I appreciated that you kind of made me look at it a little differently but I still think it has a horrible message <laughs> that you're not, you don't be yourself. You do whatever you can to get someone. It also portrays teenagers as just raging hormones. <laughs> teenagers <laughs> are raging hormones. Don't you remember? Well, there's so much more to them. I have teenagers and that's not them. <laughs> I'm well, sorry. That's what you like to think. No, there's so much more to them than this film. This gives them credit for it, But the music and the dancing is so much fun. But I don't care. Uh, <laughs> Matt, what do you think of Laura's point of view about the the message this kind of sends, specifically for women? Well, I I think where the the message comes together, and I thought about doing this for my moral universe portion, but decided against it. But I I think you you put two scenes together when um, Olivia Newton John's character, when Sandy comes back. And she's kind of transformed herself into who Danny always kind of thought would be a desirable person. I thought that was such a – again, that that's where the message is ex extra, like, just bad because Danny at one point got awfully close to committing a crime. He gropes her. You know, he's trying to force himself on her. He, you could say he's got no game, but he it didn't look right. I mean, it, it looked like um, a lot more than a horny boy being a horny boy. It, it looked like somebody who had was trying to force himself on her, and for her to emerge out of that and then and then go to this um, portrayal of herself as this uh, you know sexually active type person. You know, basically she went from a from the prude to the available girl who who wanted to get out there and put her sexuality out there. To me, that really kind of puts the the woman in her place in this movie as somebody who needs to be sexually appealing to this horny guy. So, no, I, I think um, is this is this the kind of movie I would want my teenage daughter to pay attention to? Absolutely not. <laughs> I don't know. I I kind of see this as a uh, gift of the magi type ending, you know, where the the husband sells his pocket watch so he can buy his wife some combs and the wife cuts her hair so she can buy her husband a chain for his pocket watch. I mean, it's Sandy changes herself for Danny because it's what he likes. He likes cars and this type of girl. And Danny changes himself because uh, she likes the jocks. And in the end, they are basically they flip flop their positions. So that that's really the only way I've I've seen this is kind of a a, a campy, gayer version of Gift of the Magi. <laughs> I well, say I would disagree with that. In that, first of all, I don't know if Sandy ever was interested in jocks. She was interested in that one jock, and I think she did that more to make Danny jealous. And she she didn't show any interest in jocks, and he did that to be more appealing to her. But as soon as she comes out in the you know black outfit with the, the teased up hair, he strips off the uh, letterman's jacket and his, his facade, his transformation is quickly left behind him. And he was once again, the greaser, and, although, you know, his speeches, you know, he's telling his friends and he finally reveals what he's done is saying, Hey, she's important to me. So, I do think there's an evolution of the character in that, but I do think that ultimately it's like, well, I can have everything I want with her right now once she makes her final transformation. So I kind of agree with Lori's, although I teased her about it and said, hey, Danny did some transformation too. Uh, I do think that she makes the 
the the the ultimate the bigger sacrifice and that's where we're supposed to see that she's moved to his side of things he didn't really move to her side of things which is just a horrible message for kids <laughs> it's not an abc after school special <laughs> no it's not all right what about the ulti- the actual ending of the film what did you guys think about the ending uh, i'll let chris start with this one i hated the ending as a kid I hated the ending as a teenager, and I hate the ending now. What, what do you um, hate? What specifically? It's just anticlimactic for me. Um, sure, the I, I do like that, you know, that he changed for her and vice versa sort of thing, but that kind of should have been the end of the, the film, or they should have done something else. That whole carnival scene, I just didn't care for it. I, I don't exactly know how you would have ended this film, but them driving off into the sky... I've always felt was lame and I will always feel that it's lame. And it just was a very flat ending to me pretty much once that dance numbers over, I I just can't, I can't deal with it. I don't, I just don't know if I understand the ending. Like, I don't, I guess I don't understand what was resolved or what needed to be. (laughs) It was like, Hey, we're dancing and now we're not, we're not banging and, now we're dancing and we might be banging and now we're in a flying car and we're all graduating like that. I, did I miss something? Like what happened there? Well, and they, they're not all graduating, by the way. Three of them true. have to take summer school if they go. And Dee Dee Khan comes back for Greece too. She's back there like three or four years later. So, well, okay, Laura, you want to go and then I'll kind of voice my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm so- I loved it. I'm sorry. I agree. The car thing was kind of weird, but I love, I love the opening credits. I love the cartoon and I love the closing credits. I love the yearbook. I love reading it and stuff. Have you ever looked at it and all the characters kind of sign and I love it. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Um, I disagree with Matt and the fact that I do think that there is some resolution is there, there is a conflict that, you know, Danny's making the pass at her at the movie theater and she she's conflicted about she she wants to be with him, but she, she kind of doesn't want to, you know, he she, she's stuck in her good girl image or good girl world. And she has to make that final transformation to, for a lack of a better word, is the tramp. Uh, and that uh, it's not I'm not saying it's a good conflict. I'm just saying that's the best description of the conflict that can be, of course, also the, the car race as well. But. I, I agree with Chris. I, I don't the sing songy literally two songs right on top of each other right there at the end just is it seems a little bit overdone and I don't like the riding off into the sunset flying in the air thing. It, it this film has a, a certain sense of realism throughout the entire film and then suddenly stops right there and it's that seemed kind of silly. Favorite song in the film, Lori. I can't pick. I read that today, and I've been thinking about it all day, and I cannot pick. I was like, you're the one that I won. Then I was like, no, we go together. And then I was like, the reprisal of Sandra D. I love that song. I can't pick. Get it under your head. You have to pick one right now. You must oh, pick one. First one on top of your head. A lot, of the, a lot of the songs from the play, Shana Na sings, there's a lot of really good songs that they don't even have in the movie that are just, they just play them at the dance. I like I don't know. I guess I'll say you're the one that I want. Cause, only because you have a gun to my head. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Favorite song in the play when you were in it? We go together. We go together? What did you play in the play? What part did you play? Frenchie. You were Frenchie? Mm-hmm. I smoked a cigarette on stage, too. The audience was like, ooh. Really? You smoked a cigarette? Because <laughs> I actually I find that more surprising than anything else. It was an herbal cigarette. We had to put a little disclaimer in the program. <laughs> did <laughs> oh did you God. blow smoke rings? I don't, I couldn't do that. I'm <laughs> Her little creepy suck it up through. Yeah, that weird. Just, <laughs> I don't, I don't know if that's a trick. It's just kind of creepy. All right, Matt, your favorite song. Uh, I, I don't know if I could name one, <laughs> but I, you know, I, I will say this. I thought the music was, was pleasant. I thought it was some of the better music in a musical I've heard. I can see that on the next Blu-ray box. The music is pleasant. <laughs> so I mean, I'm not saying Some I dislike it, and that's music. why I can't pick one. It's just only because having watched the movie once, and I, you know, I can't, I can't tell you. You've never seen this film before? No. Oh, really? That's that. That I find shocking. 
So you should you should be shocked, Chris. As a kid, it was um, the hand jive because it was just a funny song to me, and they're all dancing goofy. And also the the little commercial with um, Jan, the brush a brush a one. <laughs> I, I always like oh, that. Yeah. I'd go around the house doing that. Um, I sing that when I brush when I, <laughs> when I brush their teeth. <laughs> I can see you doing that. As an adult, the summer night song cracks me up every time because she's telling everybody how sweet he was and polite and his manners and all that. And he's uh, basically telling all his buddies what a whore she is and she puts out and all that. It, it's just a funny juxtaposition of the two. And so that one makes me laugh more now. No, I, I was stuck between summer nights and you're the one that I want, but I think it comes out. I think the more fun song is uh, You're the One That I Want, and I really like that. And I was actually, I didn't know that until Lori mentioned that, that it was not actually in the play. I knew uh, Hopelessly Devoted to You wasn't in the play, but I didn't know that um, that song, uh, You're the One I Want, wasn't. And that would make me not want to see the play, because that would be one of the songs I'm looking forward to hearing. No, it's so. a good song. The song that's in the play is, is good. It's, it's, just, it's just different. It's more of a true, it's more of a 50s song, and I think they wanted they released that as a single before the movie came out. It was in the top 40 before the movie even came out. So, mm. I mean, they wanted a, they wanted a modern song. And I like Grease too. And I think it's really cool that they had Frankie Valley sing it. Yeah. No, Grease is a good song too. I like the actual theme song to Grease as well, but I, I like the, you're the one that I want much better. All right. This wasn't on the outline, but Lori, least favorite song. Least favorite song. Oh boy. And you can't use the brush of brush of song. So. Because I don't count probably, that as a song. Probably Sandy. I always just skip that on the record. It's just kind of a boring song. But the song from the play is hilarious. He, he's like, it sung like real falsetto. And he's like, because the heater doesn't work as good as you. <laughs> like that. It's really funny. He's like, I'm alone at the drive-in movie. It's really funny. Matt, I know you said you didn't have a favorite. But is there one that you did not like? I'm in the same boat. I can't single one out. Chris. Um, how many are there? Uh, <laughs> the Sandy one I don't care for. And uh, I don't know. Um, is Alone at the Drive-In? Are that's they the, the same? same? Th that's the same song. And, um, Stranded at and the, the Drive-In. Uh, the other one I don't really care for is uh, The Rock and Roll is Here to Stay. But that really isn't um, made for this film. I think that was already out before uh, this film ever came out. So, Oh, Beauty School Dropout. That's the one I can't uh, stand. So it's my least favorite. I it, didn't. I didn't like it till I lived it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just she, she, it just it slows down the pace of the film. That just goes off in a tangent that I didn't think it needed to be there. Other than you wanted to introduce Frankie Avalon into the. Okay, into, did you know that Stocker Channing and the Pink Ladies are the and Dinah Manoff are the the girls in the rollers? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and in the play it's much more campy and funny and they don't sing it serious. Okay. Um, they make it serious in the movie and it kind of, it's not the same song. It kind of ruins it. <laughs> I didn't think it was that serious in the film. No, you have to see the play. It's really funny. I mean, they sing it like they're like, na, 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 like that. They don't sing it pretty. Oh, uh, and I don't and think just, they sing it pretty really in funny. this. But. <laughs> What'd you say? I didn't think they sang it pretty. Frankie <laughs> Valley does, a, you know, or Frankie Avalon does a, a good job, I guess. I just, I, I just think it takes the film in a different direction for five minutes that didn't need to go. Well, it's not really necessary to the what little story this movie had. Correct. And I really just don't care about Dee Dee Con. It's, <laughs> it's another parody of fifties, the angel, the Teen Angel movies and stuff. That's the point of it. All right, let's talk about the film's legacy and whether we'd put this in our top 100 of all time. First, grossed over, and I was surprised about this, over $394 million worldwide on initial release and was, at the time, the third highest grossing film of all time behind Star Wars and Jaws. I didn't know it was that successful. I knew it was successful. But Is that not inflation adjusted? That's not at the time it made, not, not inflation adjusted. So inflation adjusted, gone with the wind, still kills everybody, but at the time was le legitimately made more money than any other film besides Star Wars and Jaws, just pure box off, no in inflation adjustment, but opened at number two at the box office behind Jaws too. 
So it's no a, way. His opening weekend did not do very well. Nominated for one Academy Award for Best Song, Hopelessly Devoted to You, which was the favorite song of none of us. Lost to a song called Thank God It's Friday from the film The Last Dance, which I have no idea what that song is. No, The Last Dance is Donna Summer. The The film's Last Dance, but the song Thank God It's Friday? No, wasn't it Last Dance? No, Thank God It's Friday is the song oh, that won. I don't know that song. Well, that was a horrible song. I, I would agree. I don't even know it. That. But it was it's the one they played it during the opening credits, isn't it? Of that I, movie. I don't. I've never seen that movie. I've never even heard. Oh of yeah. It. <laughs> so, uh, AFI's Hundred Years, Hundred Passions, number ninety-seven. Uh, Hundred Years, Hundred Songs, number seventy for Summer Nights. Chris's favorite. Chris's favorite song. AFI's Greatest Movie Musicals, only number twenty. I was actually surprised about that. In two thousand eight, Empire Magazine placed it in it as one of its five hundred greatest films. Uh, voted as the best musical ever by Channel 4, which is one of the British television network's uh, channels, uh, 100 Greatest Musicals. Film was also ranked number 21 on Entertainment Weekly's list of 50 best high school films. Another surprising fact to me, not in the na National Film Registry, and that actually surprised me a lot. And Rotten Tomatoes, 79% uh, critics, 88% audience. Chris, are you surprised by anything in this? And would you put it in your top 100 greatest films of all time? You know, the only thing that really surprises me is that it's not in the National Film Registry. As a kid, I remember there's five films that I remember as a kid. And I don't know how big Greece was compared to them, but um, Star Wars and Jaws, which you said um, this was behind, are two of the five. So. I I don't really that doesn't surprise me in the slightest. I do remember it being very big back in the day. I do remember seeing it in the theater and the drive-in when I was a little kid. I had the um the album. I knew all the songs. I probably did all the little dances and butchered all the words as a little uh six-year-old kid would, uh not really realizing all the innuendo in this. So for me, this is oh, and always will be a top 100 film. I don't know where I would put in it, but there's so much nostalgia in this film for me that uh, it will always be a, um, a top 100 film. Matt. Yay. The only uh, one that surprised well, two, two surprised me. I'm surprised as gross as much money as it did. And I'm surprised that someone would call it the greatest musical of all time. I could see how uh, lovers of musicals would put it up there, but I don't think this is the, this is the greatest musical that we've done on our podcast. So with that said, I don't know what it is about nostalgia movies. Maybe it's because um, I uh, am more of the high school dropout type than the uh, guy who had a great time. But they just do nothing for me. And uh, this movie being pure nostalgia did closer to absolutely nothing for me. <laughs> so I'm going to leave it out of my top 100. Don't ever see Grease 2 then, Matt. <laughs> yeah, no <laughs> kidding. Um, Although Michelle Pfeiffer redeems that and Lorna left. Uh, I, I know we took a lot of, I know Matt and Chris and I took a lot of heat, especially from that letter from Jason when we bagged all over singing in the rain. And we mentioned that Greece would probably be one of the few musicals, one of the musicals it was cited at least by me, maybe by Chris that he put in his top 100 films of all time. And, uh, you know, going into this, I would have told you, yeah, I put it in my top 100. Um, now, after watching it again, I don't think I would. I really don't think I put it in my top 100. It's it's probably as close as could be. It's probably one of my, it's pr if not my favorite musical, one of my top two. But it's it's ultimately a pretty si silly film, and I just don't think it's better than a lot of other films out there. Maybe there's some musicals, and I'm also just not a fan of musicals. It's hard for me to bump something else that I really care about <laughs> that I think is a really great film to put in something that I think is just a fun time. I I'm surprised at how successful Grease was, but the nostalgia for this film that has developed over the last you know, nearly 40 years now... I, I'm surprised that it's not in the National Film Registry. I'm actually surprised it's not on the top 100 lists, a uh, more 100 lists. I know it's not going to be on mine, but I don't speak for everyone out there. So uh, I would not put it in my top 100, although it's probably as close as a musical will get. 
it's it's still a film I enjoy. I like it. I own it. Uh, I will confess, I saw Grease 2 before I ever saw Grease. So that caused me almost not to ever see Grease because Grease 2 is horrible. But Lori, this is your film, so you get the final word. I'm speechless. No, <laughs> I just love it. It's A lot of it is nostalgia. I just love the songs that's emotional to me so but it's it's in probably my top 20 and it's it's just it's just fun if you if you just ignore <laughs> bad, bad acting by 40 year olds trying to act like there, i disagree with that i think the acting was was great it's not it's not meant to be shakespeare it's meant to be fun and kind of, uh, I don't know. I, I think, I think everything no. comes together and is great. It is a, it is a fun film. That's what it is. Now, Laura, let me ask you this now. You know, I believe I, when we reviewed star Wars, now star Wars is a film that defined my movie watching experience. I'd seen movies before star Wars. I remember seeing star Wars. And after that, I remember seeing films meant a lot more to me. Um, because that film, they, they, they became more than just entertainment. I became fascinated with films. Would you say that Grease has the same effect on you, that, that this is that type of film for you? Absolutely. And that's probably why I love musicals. That this puts you on that dark path that you forever. <laughs> yes. All right. That does it for this week's review of Grease. Thanks again for joining us and listening into our little bi-weekly podcast. And if you've had a good time, uh, the fun doesn't have to stop here. You can follow us on Facebook at Movie House Memories or on Twitter at MH Memories. On either Facebook or Twitter, you can keep up on our written film reviews, news on upcoming films and Blu-ray releases, and information on upcoming podcasts on either Movie House Memories, Mail Bonding, which is mine and Chris and Matt's other little show, or Lunchtime Movie Review, our 80s film review, where someday I'm sure we will re review Grease 2. <laughs> So after this one, maybe the four of us can get back together and bag on that film. So, can I, I was going to say, can I join you for that? Sure, absolutely. So, You're going to have to sing the cool writer yeah. song for us then. No, no, no. She's got she's to oh, oh, sing oh. Reproduction. 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 <laughs> and, and don't sit there and tell me sexual innuendo is not a portion, part of that film uh, as well. Get, okay, I know that, but I They're didn't They're talking get about it. scientific experiments. Yeah, they're talking Patrick. about flowers and stuff. Right. What's the lyrics? Well, that's it for this episode of Movie House Memories. Next time, it's my pick again, and I am picking The Godfather. So, uh, boys and girl, you've got some uh, heavy movie watching to do in the next couple weeks. So, until next time, I'm Patrick. And I'm Coach Chris. I'm Lori. Come on, Sandra D. <laughs> and I'm Greasy Man. <laughs> and we'll see you next time at our house. podcast is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. The theme music for Movie House Memories, Hiding Your Reality, is provided courtesy of Kevin McLeod at Incomputech.com under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of the MHN Podcast Network, Movie House Memories, and Buzz Eat Bunny Slippers Entertainment LLC unless otherwise known. Hey, hang on a second. My son is playing some like piano thing out in the. <laughs> it's very pretty. We should keep it. Hey. <laughs>